The best way to know someone is to know what they believe. What do they teach? And so we are looking at Jesus' teachings in the Sermon on the Mount. If I can find the right spot. Okay. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is laying out the principles for the new kingdom. He came to establish a new covenant, to reestablish the kingdom with men, to bring the kingdom to fruition. The very first thing he preached was, repent, for the kingdom is at hand. The very first thing John preached was, repent, for the kingdom is at hand. Jesus talked about the kingdom more than anything else. And so, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is laying out what it's like to be a citizen of his kingdom. And he is trying to get across to the Jews that it's not so much a matter of the rules and regulations that matters. It's what's in the heart. It's getting your... your attitudes right, to get your love straight, but it's about the heart. And so Jesus is now in a section, he first talked about the what we call the Beatitudes, the eight principles that everything else is based on. But now he's in a section of application, if you will. <clears throat> and he's going over what the Jews had traditionally believed. Much of it was uh, change from what God originally had intended for the Jews to understand. And so Jesus is trying to get across to the Jews that some of the things they had believed for centuries might have been a little understand, misunderstanding. And so we come to verses 33 in chapter 5, and he says, Again, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, Do not break your oath, but keep your oaths you have made to the Lord. But I tell you, do not swear at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by the earth, for it's his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make even one hair white or black. Simply let your yes be yes, and your no, no. Anything beyond that comes from the evil one. Now to understand this passage, as well as most of the rest of them, we have to understand a little bit of the Jewish background behind this. Now, in the Old Covenant, God had laid down certain principles and rules about taking an oath. God allowed the Jews to take an oath, but the rule was you have to keep it. There were very strict rules about keeping the oath. God will not let someone go unpunished who breaks an oath he has made. And there were very strict rules about when you could break an oath. And the only time you could break an oath is if the husband of a wife or the father of a girl could, could break the oath. But God was very adamant about keeping your oath. If you say something, then you do it. And over the centuries, the Jews had kind of tried to work their way around this particular uh, rule. Now, the Jews as a people and the, the teachers of the law and the rabbis had gotten very strict about, you must tell the truth. But they had also come up with a way of kind of fudging, cheating the system. Now, if you remember when we were kids, if you crossed your fingers, you could say, oh, I didn't mean it because my fingers are crossed. <clears throat> That's kind of legalized cheating. Well, the Jews had actually institutionalized legalized lying. It's just phenomenal that, <laughs> that a religion could come to this state. But this is what Jesus is addressing. And the Jews had come up with the idea that if you take an oath, now when they say oath taking, they're not talking about cursing. They're talking about uh, saying, well, by God, I'll do so and so, or by the hair on my head, I'll do so and so, or by the, uh, the temple of God, I'll do so and so. <clears throat> And the Jews had come to the point by the time of Christ that if you use the name of God, then that was binding. If you use God's name in any form or fashion in your oath, 
by, by the witness of God, I will do this, then you have to do it. There's no getting out of it. But if you use something else, and as Jesus said here, if you swear by Jerusalem or by the gold of the temple or by the temple or whatever, then that wasn't binding. And so they had actually institutionalized lying. And so what Jesus is saying here is essentially, look, guys, just tell the truth. It doesn't do any good to, to say, well, if I say by the temple or, or by the city Jerusalem, then I'll do so and so, and that doesn't count. He's saying, wherever God is, God's everywhere. If you talk about the city of Jerusalem, well, that's God's city. If you talk about the temple, that's God's temple. If you talk about the gold, God made the gold. If, no matter what you talk about, if you talk about the hair on your head, God made your hair. So whatever you're swearing by, whatever you're taking an oath by, that's you're, you can't kick God out of anywhere. And so God's people just tell the truth. He said, if you say yes, do it. If you say no, don't do it. Just tell the truth. That Jesus is trying to get rid of all this extraneous stuff and just say, just tell the truth. Now, some have misunderstood this passage just to do away with all oath taking. That you can't go to court and put your hand on the Bible and say you'll tell the truth. That's not the purpose of this. Jesus is not forbidding all oath taking. We have several examples of where Paul the Apostle took oaths. So he's not forbidding oath taking. He's forbidding lying is what he's doing. The whole point of this is to say, tell the truth. And if you tell the truth, everything will be fine. Uh, so it, it's, it's not meant to be that complicated. Jesus just says, tell the truth. If you say you're going to do it, do it. If you don't, if you say you're not going to do it, don't do it. Everything else, he said, everything beyond that comes from the evil one. In other words, anytime you try to get around the truth, anytime you try to uh, trick someone, that's wrong. Just tell the truth. It's that simple. And for Christians, that should not be that complicated a matter. <clears throat> he now turns to another area that was very common to the Jews, but it can be misunderstood. <clears throat> you have heard that it was said. Now remember, he's starting all these, and these are things the Jews had been taught for centuries. These are things that some of it came out of the old law, some of it were interpolations of the law, some of it were interpretations by various rabbis. Some of the things had changed drastically over the centuries, and so Jesus is trying to bring them back to the pure truth of God. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Now, in reality, this was part of the old law. In Exodus chapter 21, in verse 23, uh, he says, uh, if, there, let's see, if there is serious injury, you are to take life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, bruise for bruise. So that was part of the law. But what we have to understand is how this was applied in reality. In the first place, this was never meant to be a vengeance thing. When you say an eye for an eye, if somebody knocks out your eye, you can knock theirs out. That was never, that was never the intent of this law. What this law was actually doing was trying to limit vengeance. Uh, it was very common if, if, say, if one member of a family hurt another member of another family, sometimes those families would go to war with each other. Or if one tribe hurt a member of another tribe, sometimes those tribes would go to war and kill dozens of people or hundreds of people. We have examples in the Bible of where vengeance was enacted against whole families or whole tribes of people. And so the purpose of this law was, it was called the Lex Talionis. It was also part of Roman law. But the purpose of the law was to limit uh, vengeance. Because if somebody breaks my finger, I want to break his arm or break his leg or kill him. And God says, no, <laughs> you, you make sure the, crime, the punishment fits the crime. Also, we also must notice that under the law of Moses, this was never to be done on an individual basis. If someone broke your arm, 
you couldn't just go and break his arm. You had to go to court, and a judge had to rule. So this was not a personal vendetta. This was to be done in a legal way. In addition, this was never carried out in reality. There's no known case of where a person's ever got his arm broken and you broke his arm. What, would, what, was, what the Jews did, and they wrote about this extensively, you would go to court. If someone broke your arm or your leg or injured you in some way, you would take them to court. The judge would then determine what the cost actually was. For example, if you broke a working man's leg, he might be out of work for six weeks. Well, he would lose six weeks of wages, and then you'd have to pay for getting his arm fixed. So the judge would enact a financial penalty. He would say, okay, this guy's going to lose, say, you know, 48 denarii of work and money because of his injury. You have to pay him that. And so that's the way the Jews understood this, that uh, yes, if a person were guilty of hurting someone, there was a penalty he had to pay, but there was not this actual ripping a man's arm off or pulling out his eye or whatever. That, <laughs> the Jews wrote extensively on this, and they never expected this to be a literal thing. And so Jesus is saying, but I tell you, if someone harms you this way, do not resist an evil person. Now again, this is not to be taken out of context. He's not saying that if someone breaks into your house in the middle of the night and starts killing your children, you just have to sit there and not resist him. There are actually people who have taken that position. That's not what he's saying. There were other elements of the law that definitely gave the right to self-defense as well as uh, legitimate law enforcement. This is not covering this kind of thing. He qualifies it. He says, if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek. What Jesus is talking about is not great physical harm. He's talking about an insult. Now, the only, most people are right-handed. And the only way a right-handed person can slap you on your right cheek is with the back of the hand. In most cultures, that is considered an insult. In Jewish culture, that was considered a deadly insult. And so Jesus is basically telling the people of his day and our day... If someone insults you, you don't have to hurt back. If someone calls you a name, you don't have to call them a name. He says, be a Christian. Be above that sort of thing. Jesus was insulted and attacked many times and did not defend himself. Jesus is saying that as Christians, we don't have to hurt people back who insult us. As a part of life, people are going to occasionally say things to us. But we don't have to hurt them back. I don't have to punch a guy in the nose because he calls me an idiot. Uh, that's, that's, the, that's what Jesus is getting at here. He's saying we are called to a higher standard. We are called to a higher level. Then he says if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt and, over your co and your coat as well, or, or hand over your coat as well, and if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them too. Now, again, that was part of their culture. In those days, the Romans had a law. In any occupied territory where there were Roman soldiers stationed, a Roman soldier could go up to a citizen of that nation. In this case, the Romans could go up to a Jewish male. And he could say, okay, I order you to carry my pack for a Roman mile, which is considerably less than one of our miles. And the citizen would be required to do that. The idea was to help out the occupying soldier. A pack is a heavy thing, and if it would help the soldier do his job for you to carry his pack for a mile, you were required to do that. That was the law. Now, the Jews naturally despised being under Roman occupation. And so what the Jews had started doing Whenever a Roman soldier would order them to carry the pack. By the way, when, Jesus, when the Simon was ordered to carry Jesus' cross, this is much the same thing. Simon was kind of impressed by the Romans to do this work. And that's kind of what we're talking about here. And so what the Jews had done to show their disrespect and their unhappiness with being occupied by the Romans, whenever a Roman soldier ordered a Jewish male to carry his pack... 
the Jew would carry the pack and, and count every step, so many steps, I think it's like a thousand steps you had to take. He would then set the pack down and spit. And what that's telling the Roman soldier is, you can make me do this, but I don't have to like it. It's kind of a, a rebellion from the inside and not the outside. Uh, you can make me do this, but you can't make me like it, is the idea. Well, what Jesus is trying to say is, let's have a better attitude. You know, if you got to do it anyway, just do it. Just follow the law and go on. You know, there's no point in making a spectacle. There's no point in acting hateful and ugly about this thing. Just do it with good spirit and move on. Just do. He says, matter of fact, offer to carry the pack another mile. Show you've got a right attitude. You know, we're trying to impress these people with how righteous and holy we are. And you people are just showing them how mean you can be, how, how spiteful. So go with them two miles if they uh, give to the one who asks you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. Now, again, this is not saying something that is untoward. There were a lot of poor people in Israel. And the Jews believed that it was the responsibility to help the poor. That's one of the high, we'll talk about that in a little bit. But one of the highest goals of righteousness was to help poor people. And Jesus is saying, if a person is truly needy. Now, he's not saying that you have to, if some guy who's taking advantage of the situation comes up to you every day and wants to borrow 20 bucks, you have to give. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, if there is a legitimate need, help the guy, you know, be, be a, a good person, be an honorable person, be an, a, a compassionate person. Uh, he, he's, <laughs> he's not saying you just have to give every dollar you've got away to anybody that wants it. That's not the point. The point is, if you see a legitimate need, try to meet the need. Show the love of God is the point here. <clears throat> and so... This was a this eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth thing has been around a long time. Uh, Jesus is, is basically saying, you know, uh, you don't have to hurt people. That's the point. You don't have to hurt if someone has insulted you. Okay. He then turns and he says, you've also heard that it was said. And again, that means that this is what you were taught under the law. Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Now, this is one of those things that is not actually in the law. God never told them to hate their enemy. That was something the Jews had come up with on their own. God did tell them to love their neighbor. Of course, the Jews assumed that their neighbor would have to be another Jew. That obviously did not include the Gentiles. The Jews hated the Gentiles. They despised the Gentiles. The rabbis actually taught that the, the, the Gentiles were made by God to be nothing but firewood for hell. That uh, you didn't have to help Gentiles. And the Jews believed if you touched a Gentile, you were unclean. And you'd have to go to the temple and offer sacrifices to get clean again. And you couldn't go into a Gentile's house and all this stuff. That was all made up by the Jews. God never said that. That's something they came up with. But they, it had risen to the level of Scripture. Now Jesus is trying to teach them an important truth. You've heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies. Now this would have been a massive change for the Jews. This idea, because they had been taught their whole lives, you hate your enemies. You hate particularly Gentiles. You hate the Romans. You hate anybody who is your enemy. And Jesus comes along and says, no. That's never been part of the law. You are to love your enemies. Now, we have to understand the word he uses here. There are several words translated love in the original language. Some of them deal with personal relationships. Some of them deal with your family or your friends. That's not the word he uses here. He's not saying that you have to like your enemies, or you have to have a warm, fuzzy feeling. That's not what he's saying at all. The word he uses here is the word which means you do what's best for that person. You don't hurt them. You don't hate them. You don't try to bring harm to them. You do what's best for them. 
It doesn't matter if he's another Jew. It doesn't matter if he's a Gentile. It doesn't matter if he's a tax collector or a Roman soldier. You treat him with decency and respect. And if you can be of help in some way, that's fine. You treat people, all people, as if they were made by God, and they are. The, pur the purpose of all Jesus' teachings here is that we are made in the image of God. And we ought to act like it. To be like God is what we're aiming for. Well, to be like God, you have to have compassion on all people. God gave goodness and good things and blessings to everybody, not just his chosen people. And he's saying to these Jews and to Christians down the road, he's saying, you treat everybody with love and decency and respect. There's no place for racism. There's no place for sexism. There's no place for treating any people differently than others. You treat everyone as a child of God. You treat everyone as a soul. You treat everyone as you would want to be treated. That's the ideal here. And so Jesus says this idea of hating your neighbor is just not going to fly. You don't hate anybody. You treat everyone with decency and respect. Now, again, he's not saying you have to like everybody. Some people are just not very likable. And if you've never met someone, it's hard to like them. But you can treat everyone that you meet with decency and respect and honor. You don't have to be mean or hateful or steal from them or hurt them. Just treat them as you would want to be treated. And that, uh, that works well. <laughs> then he says... <clears throat> I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Now, those that actually try to hurt you, he says, pray for them. And the point is, if you're actually praying for someone, it's hard to hate them. It's hard to hurt them. So this, again, is that, that acting like God. Now, all of us have been God's enemies, and we all deserve to be punished. God could have wiped us out. But God loved us enough to give us another chance. And so he's saying that even though some people are going to hurt you and persecute you and say mean things about you, you don't have to hurt them back. Just treat them again with decency and honor, no matter what kind of person they are. It doesn't depend on you what they do. They'll answer to God for their own faults. I treat everyone with decency and honor, no matter how they are. He then uses an odd phrase here. He says... He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good. Now, this is backward the way we would say it. To us, sunshine is good and rain is bad. But this was a desert climate. In a desert climate, rain is good, sunshine is bad. And so what he's saying is, God sends the sun and the rain on both evil people and good people. God treats us all the same. God doesn't withhold the rain and, and send the sun to bake you out if you're not a Jew. He's saying God's going to bless everybody. Uh, he sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. In other words, God is going to bless everybody. So our job is to act more like God, to treat people with decency and honor and says, just don't go there. This hating others and you don't have to make that choice. Just treat everybody as God wants you to. Treat everybody as God does because God treats everybody with blessings and don't, don't even go there. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? He says everybody does that. Even the tax collectors do that. <laughs> now Jesus isn't saying tax collectors are bad. He's just saying that's the way you've been taught. He's saying everybody loves the the people in their lives that they love. Everybody loves their friends and their family. He says, but we are called to a higher level. God loves all of us, even if we don't deserve it. So we should be more like God. He said, don't eat, what, what, if you greet only your own people, what, what are you doing more than others? Even the pagans do that. So he's saying, again, everybody is a child of God. Everybody is made in God's image. We're all in the same boat. God blesses us all. And so we need to be a blessing to everyone. We don't get to choose who we mistreat and who we treat well. Just treat everybody as we should. And then God will let God sort out the evil in the end. 
Then he says, be perfect. Therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. <laughs> now, again, he's not saying that we have to be without fault. That's not the word he's using here. <clears throat> the word he's using here means the idea of be useful. To Jewish thinking, if an object was perfect, that meant that it was... The Jews had a much more concrete understanding of theology than we do. We think in turn more of, uh, of uh, heavy theology. The Jews thought of everything in practical terms. Matter of fact, they usually, the names they called God was the God who gives justice, the God who blesses, the God who does certain things. That's the way they thought of God. We think of God as some mystical thing out here on, in heaven sitting on a cloud somewhere, but the Jews thought of God as actually doing things. Well, to them, a perfect something is something that's useful for its intended purpose. For example, let's say you find a Phillips head screw that needs tightening. Well, you go into your toolbox and you find a screwdriver that's just the right size and just got the right Phillips head on it. And then you tighten your screw and you say, well, oh, that, that screwdriver was perfect for this job. Doesn't mean the screwdriver doesn't have any faults. It just means for its purpose, it, it was perfect. And that's the idea Jesus is saying here. He's saying, God made us to live in his world and to help each other. And God helps us. God loves us. And so for us to be perfect means that we are useful to other people. We don't live here just to satisfy our own needs. We're not here to take care of only ourselves. We are to be useful as humans living in God's world. And so that's the idea here. Jesus is saying, be useful to people. Be kind to people. Be helpful to people. You don't have to like them. They might be your enemies. Pray for them. Be helpful. Be useful to them. That's what God wants us to do. That's what Jesus is calling his citizens to behave like. It doesn't matter whether they like us or we just are to be useful people. And we're not to be mean and bullying people. and <laughs> We are to, to represent Jesus Christ and to love others. <clears throat> now in chapter 6, Jesus kind of shifts gears. And he spends a large section of chapter 6 talking about a problem that we as humans have. This is kind of a universal thing for us. One of our one of our strong desires is to be liked by others, to be admired by others, to be respected by others. And there's nothing wrong with that unless we carry it to a wrong point. And so now Jesus is going to talk about the subject of when you do good, when you practice things that you're supposed to, what is your motivation? He says, be careful, be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. In other words, what is my motivation? Why do I do good things? Why do I help people? Why do I pray? And he, he talks about three separate incidents here to represent everything. But these are the three things the Jews considered to be the highest form of righteousness. We'll talk more about these next week. But he's going to now spend this large section talking about when you do what's good... What is your motivation? Is it so you can get patted on the back, so you can be proud of yourself, so others will be proud of you and brag on you? He's saying if that's your motivation, that's all the rewards you're going to get. God is not going to give you credit for that. Next week, we will talk about these things in much more detail because they are crucial and it's a problem that all of us have. Thank you for joining us today.